Our gospel reading this morning comes from the 21st chapter of Luke, which is on page 85 in your pew Bible in the New Testament section, and the reading begins at the fifth verse. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They ask him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes into various places and famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will be perished. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. I suspect I'm not the only person in the room that gets weary from time to time. Now, I'm not thinking so much about physical tired, for from the moment we are born, we need to sleep and rest. But I am thinking about long-term weariness, mental as well as physical fatigue, sometimes even withdrawing from life because it just seems too difficult to keep on probably happens to each of us from time to time. It happens to groups, too, including churches. Now, weariness, I think, sets in in the face of devastating natural disasters. Here we go again. Here we go again with a major storm and seemingly insurmountable cleanup and recovery. And so in recent history, we've slogged through the aftermath of 9-11. We fretted over the destruction brought by uh, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita and then the tsunami in Indonesia. And then we had a fertilizer plant explode. And oh my gosh, and now the devastation in the Philippines. Thousands are missing, over 600,000, they guess are estimated to have been displaced. And if you've read the articles, you know that storm went on and it ended up in Vietnam and they had some warning. And so they tried to move 600,000 people out of the way of the storm. And so my question is, where do you move 600,000 people? It's enough to make us all tired and weary. The First Presbyterian Church in Arlington, our neighbor to the east, is 125 years old this year. In 1988, they were 100, and I had just joined that staff as an interim associate pastor part-time. Now, the actual birthday of that congregation is in April. Do you know what they did for their 100th birthday? Nothing. Not one thing. The congregation was in a pastoral transition. It was hard. There had been a committee, of course. 
but it had fallen apart. At the time of the actual birthday, the very part-time stated supply placer had left. I was a less than three-month tenured part-time interim associate. There was nobody in the pastoral position, and that anniversary went completely uncelebrated. Now, not to celebrate 100 years of ministry is not a terrible thing, but it was sad. And there was a lot of weariness in that congregation, and it took a lot of time and a lot of prayer and a lot of hard work for them to be able to move forward. So now it's their 125th anniversary, and they have had not one celebration this year, but four spread out all over the year. Part of that celebration, I think, is a testimony that they have learned at least partly, the cure for weariness and by locating the source of stamina. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, now written in Old English of the 17th century, has a question. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification. In other words, is there anything in God's love for us right now? Here's the answer. The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification or adoption and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. Perseverance, stamina, endurance, they are gifts from God. As is a spirit of faithfulness. And they can help us combat weariness. Weariness also can be guarded against by renewed commitment and that endurance and that faithfulness. So I've been thinking about how that might play out in our life here together. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to talk about money. We'll just get that over with up front. Because you deserve a financial update. So far, we have 39 pledges for 2014, totaling $161,816. That amount of money is the second largest amount of money ever pledged in the history of this congregation. Good job. But, did you guess there might be a but in here? Yes. We have 70 giving units, but there are only 39 pledges, and we need to do better. Now, are you already weary about some preacher standing up here talking about money? Maybe. It's not the end all, but it's part of the foundation for our worship and our study and our service. It's one of the tools that we have to do God's work. And so we need to do better than 39, which is only 55%. You see, I think everybody can give something, even if it's only a dollar a month. Maybe a dollar a week. That would be $52 a year. See, I believe it's not the amount of money, although the more money, the more tools. But it's each of us being a giver. Each of us committed and invested in the life of this congregation. So hang on and try not to get weary. Well, second of all, we're going to talk about our new hymnal. Now, so far we have 64. And our goal is still 150, so that's about 42% or so. Now, I know some of you are not much interested in a new hymnal because you kind of maybe like the one we have in Truth is, so do I. And I know a lot of hymn numbers without looking them up, so now I have to learn all new ones. And the new hymnal has all these songs in it I've never seen before. And I know a lot of songs. But guess what? 
A lot of our old favorites are back. If you happen to be an old favorite person. God be with you till we meet again. I love to tell the story. It is well with my soul. We may sing that the first week we have them. Leaning on the everlasting arms, Rock of Ages. Yes, in our new book, we've got Rock of Ages. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling and standing on the promises. We may have to sing four hymns every week to get them all in. <laughs> Third, a report on building cleaning, which took place on November 9th. It was not a big crowd, but boy, did they work. Now, if you are thinking, oh my gosh, are we at that again? I'm so tired of having to talk about all these chores. Well, yeah, we're talking about it again. Because it's part of making this place welcoming to those who come. And speaking of buildings, did you listen to that conversation that Jesus had with his disciples about the temple in Jerusalem? It was quite a building. Some of you may have read about it. The third temple. First temple, of course, was built by King Solomon in the 10th century and then destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century. It was rebuilt in the 5th century. This is all before Jesus. Then destroyed again in the 2nd century by the Greek soldiers under the leadership of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now we're at the third temple, begun by Herod the Great in 19 B.C., and finally finished in 64. So at the time Jesus is having this conversation, they're still working on it. Now it's in use, but they're still working on it. Herod's temple was indeed a pretty spiffy building. It was made of marble. They tell us some of it was green, some of it was white. Huge, massive blocks. 67 and a half feet long, 7 and a half feet high and nine feet wide. The eastern front and some of the sides were covered in gold plate. Archaeological evidence tells us that other lavish stonework, precious jewels, rich fabrics, and many bowls and basins and candlesticks made out of gold. It was an amazing place. It was huge, and it looked like it would last forever. Well, Jesus knew that the building, amazing as it was, would not last forever. And in fact, by the time Luke is actually writing down this account of the gospel, it's gone, destroyed in 70 by the Roman army, and has not yet been rebuilt. But its transiency is important to note because that which truly lasts is from God. And it's by our endurance that we cling to God. And so when the question comes, do we get weary? The answer is yes. But we are called to endure by God and God helps us do just that. The Apostle Paul began his missionary work about mid-century, about 50 A.D. Made three missionary journeys through Asia Minor and into Greece and Italy. The church in Thessalonica, which was the capital city and the largest city in Macedonia, was founded on his second journey. Now, Thessalonica was a very prosperous city. It's on a major highway and on one of the best harbors of the Aegean Sea. But Paul worried about this new congregation, even though it existed in a place where there were many resources. The city was financially rich. It had lots of different religious traditions. And Paul was afraid that those would end up being big temptations and diverting the people away from their faith. So the second letter Paul wrote to the Thessalonians lifted up some of the challenges and the temptations that arose from the culture in which they lived. Hurdles that Paul was afraid would sap their faith and make them weary. Now, some of the church members thought Jesus was going to be coming back really soon, and so they had just given up doing anything. They weren't working. They weren't contributing to the life of the church in any way. 
And lots of, throughout the years, lots of commentators have written about this passage. Because it says, well, those who don't work shouldn't eat. Although, in other places, of course, we're commanded to feed the hungry. And so that's been a struggle in Christian discipleship. But I think Paul was really focused on the community, the church as a group. And life in the community requires everyone to participate. Everybody can do something. We each can give something. Some of you will want to purchase new hymnals. Some can help clean. Some can serve on a committee or teach or sew a quilt, pray, participate in Bible study, sing in the choir, and first of all, be together in worship, giving praise to God. And then when we get weary, which we all do from time to time, we can help one another. It is clear, as we have said to one another before, that the commitment to Jesus Christ is our first commitment. But then that commitment has to be lived out in our worship and our witness within our community of faith and out in the world. One of the earliest descriptions of Christians was offered by a man named Tertullian who lived in Carthage in what we now call Tunisia. He lived from 160 to 220 AD. He wrote extensively, but he's probably the most famous for this quote, arguing that those outside the church should say of Christians, look how they love one another. Parenthesis, they'll know we are Christians by our loves in the new book too. But Tertullian was probably right. Folks should be awed by our love and all the ways that we can demonstrate it. And when we get weary, we're to call to mind and heart these two verses. Do not be weary in doing what is right. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Now, the Greek word for endurance that Jesus used is also used in the Revelation in two of the letters to the seven churches in the second and third chapters of that book. In both Ephesus and Thyatira, the faith community is commended for their endurance. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. Weariness is our experience. It's an experience of being human. Endurance is a quality of Christian discipleship a characteristic of a member of God's family, a description of an antidote to weariness, one of the gifts from God. And I believe that God will give it even to us. Thanks be to God.